Herbert's Hundred Harem. The axiom is enhancing and twisting around every part of his body. Every slight waver of the wind and the tiny particles that make up a scent is noted, registered, and used to help hunt his prey. Unfortunately, the difference between a Zedan that's been rejuvenated so many times that it's impossible to tell if she's 20 or 2001 that's actually 20 is impossible. He also doesn't know exactly what Yzma eats or considers tasty either, so he can't exactly track her that way. The lingering scents of other people in Defenestration Nation are blurring the trail. The problem is that she can simultaneously use Axiom in huge amounts and blur it with the background. So she's got her every presence and trait hidden away. But there is a trace left, one that Herbert is needing to pick up as he goes, as he wasn't trained to track by faint traces. He has been trained to shadow and infiltrate. But he's not an idiot and he's capable of learning on the fly. The outermost extremes of a Zedan's limbs are hard and sharp meaning that she's gouging the environment ever so slightly, meaning she's leaving a trail, tiny, difficult to spot, and she knows it. Her trail is minute and scattered, using the axiom to cushion the markings, but they are there, tiny traits, and he's learning her scent, tracking her slowly. She still needs to breathe, so she must draw breath and she must taint the air. The slight scratches, the tiny puffs of scent, and his knowledge of Zedden psychology and physiology has led him in a twisting, doubling back pattern all around the complex. She's also slapped a time limit on him in that she'll reveal herself when the others show up. He checks the time on his visor. Five minutes left. The fact that the woman also moved out of the infrared and ultraviolet range is more than a little impressive. She's got practice hiding from her own kind. A lot of it. The slight wind that passes through Defenestration Nation means that whatever sound her lungs is making is being drowned out. Not to mention that it's sweeping away the ever so slight scent, but it's also of use. The wind is carrying the particles in specific directions. He just needs to backtrack them. Then it hits him. The sensation. She's directly watching him, not tracking him with sound scent or axiom, but her eyes are on him directly. He turns and faces her. The winds are winding around the nearby buildings and sweeping the scent into a circle away from her, dangerously clever. He trusts his instincts and blurs. His lashing out foot is caught in a sheeton reinforced palm cushioned with axiom, as is his other foot and both hands. That's the problem of having two less limbs than the other. Isma fades into full visibility, stuck to the side of a building and with her tail acting as an anchor point as it stretches back to wedge her to the side, all the better without digging in. Her smile shows more and more teeth as she clearly reevaluates him. How? What did you sense? What made you so sure I was here? She asks in a fascinated tone. Wait, no, I've seen that before, but never in an apex. Your kind were hunted in the past. The instincts remain. Basically, Herbert concedes before shifting probability in a tight bit of control and is now on top of the building that Esma's clinging to. He sits down and regards her with a smile. There are a lot of animals back on Earth that can and will take a chunk out of an unwary human if you find yourself in their territory. The safest parts of the world are the ones where the local population systematically hunted them down. Harsh, but what else can you expect when two predators clash? I see, without Axiom to help you need your instincts even more fine-tuned than most. Slower evolution too so they have time to get baked in, she says before nodding. Good, very good. Not a normal way to track someone, but it worked. Right, well... We've only got a couple of minutes. No way I can find you again if you vanish. So let's go out and greet the others. Herbert remarks before considering and pulling out a pair of shoes from out of an expanded pouch and slipping them on over his low-profile armor-covered feet. It's not fair to them if my steps are almost completely silent. He also slips off the gloves and pockets them, more small traces to leave behind for the girls. 
They're not exactly as devoted and driven as himself to training and self-improvement. So what makes you think you can do as you have? Isma suddenly asks as they walk to the entrance. Me, humanity, or what? He asks, and she smiles. Both, really. Humanity has to do something. We don't have the luxury of experience or a huge amount of resources, so audacity is the name of the game, which is much the same for myself. I don't have centuries of skill behind me. I don't have wealth on an absurd degree. I have to do something, so I'll just be the best I can be and as bold as I can be. Simple, but it works. Making up for a lack of quantity with sheer quality, the difference between a canvas painting done by a master of the craft and a large bolt of canvas cloth. Isma notes and Herbert blinks in confusion. Why did you go to canvas with that? Herbert asks and she titters. I could have also set a diamond against base carbon or a delicate vintage versus a river, but the point remains the same. You recognize that there is far less of your kind and therefore each one must be astounding. Sort of. We're also playing for time. Time will increase our numbers, exponentially no less. It's going to happen, though. We've got enough technological blueprints and tested low or even zero axiom tech. Most of it is theoretical or exists only as a collage project so someone can earn their mastery in their field. Isma interrupts him. Yes, but there's enough of it and it can all be recreated with technology available on Earth. We should have enough of it to make transport out of cruel space into something easily repeatable and without all the strife and struggle this first attempt had, Herbert says. Our next ship back home will have not only mountains of proof, but entire shipments of supplies and prefabricated parts to make the next Dauntless-class ship something they can send out almost as soon as they can crew it. But will they come as your reinforcement or as you executioner? No doubt there will be many furious minds in response to the announcement of the undaunted. She asks, and he can only shrug. Should worse come to worse, you and your wives will be taken care of. I can hide a hundred and one as easily as one. I can hide a thousand easily as well. There are places. There are ways. Thank you, Herbert says, looking up at her. I mean it. Thank you. Your family now. Don't think I didn't catch the scent. You're giving me a great grandchild. I am the grand matriarch of my line. Even if it wasn't a pleasure to help my family, it would still be a duty. She says, and he smiles at that. Although I have heard something about a rather entertaining rumor. His smile widened somewhat at the blatant change of subject. Oh, like what? Apparently a rather adorable young man named Private Stream has been seen wandering around. Do you know anything about him? The teasing tone tells him she clearly knows what's up. Oh yes, he's about as overeager as they come, but damn it if it doesn't just make him more endearing. He's in way over his head though. Poor kid, Herbert says, and Isma giggles somewhat. I was never much for character acting and the such, but it is a fascinating skill, as much something from a vid as it is a practical ability. Sir Philip has told me time and again that much of the art of infiltration and other such arts can be traced back into basic street tricks and general sheer audacity. Acting as someone else? That's certainly part of it. As much an act of being brazen as an outright skill. After all, you need to say your lies with complete and total sincerity and certainty. Herbert says before grinning. Unless, of course, part of the act involves being caught in a lie and then spilling the supposed truth, it gets complicated quickly, which it's best to lay your foundations on a few basics. It's certainly interesting, Yzma says as they get within visual distance of the entrance. So, have you thought of any names yet? Oh boy, Herbert says, stopping as if seeing a train coming down the tunnel. Isma outright laughs at the sight. Terrified? Somewhat? We've been using a medicine to increase the chances of male births, so the odds that most are human is rather high. 
which means I need to figure out a lot of new names and there's also the fact that I don't know how a human baby will respond to being born to another race. There's a lot we have in common with Yaoya and Zayden, but the physical differences might terrify a baby. It's one thing to be a new father, another to be a father to hundreds, and another still to be a father to hundreds that are absolutely terrified of their mothers on an instinctual level. That I can reassure on without issue. I've given birth to many daughters of many different races. There is a little uncertainty at first if there's a large difference between mother and child. But the baby learns almost right away when they're not in danger. They'll know their mothers. Isma assures him. Really? There is nothing in common between a Lopin and a Zaydan, or a Sonir and a Zaydan, or a Mera, or AKA, or Erumenta and a Zedan. Yet, I have had daughters of each of those races. If there is a single moment of fear in their hearts for me, then it passes so quickly that they do not even think to cry. Humans may be exotic, but you're not that exotic. You'll be fine. Isma assures him and he lets out a sigh of relief. Still, on the topic of my little girls, do you want some stories? Yes, please. And may I record them so I can pass them around? He asks and she laughs. Of oh, course. Now, where to begin? I've had so many and there are so many stories to share, she says with a wide smile. Her tail comes around and is waving happily from side to side, opposite of her gait. Whatever tension there was between them is thoroughly faded. That method of walking is a lazy, unthinking way of moving that shows a Zedin is completely at ease. All right, I know where to start. To begin, you first need to know that if a non-aquatic race gives birth to an AKA, it actually changes their morphology quite a bit. It randomizes the traits they have and also exaggerates the tail and forward fins. Think of it like a Lydra's lower body but on a smaller and less dangerous scale. If my little iridescent hadn't come out covered in toxic spines at any rate. Oh, the lionfish style, a.k.a. Those girls are rare, Herbert says as he nods in understanding. Lionfish? Brightly colored fish with very fancy frills that look almost like the mane of a great cat. Hidden among those strands, though, are deadly barbs. Although if you get the barbs off, they're actually pretty good eating. You humans will eat anything, Isma says in slight wonder. Naw, nah, Herbert dismisses before explaining. Steel and glass are pretty nasty. Most wood is just bad, and while marrow can be nice, bones are usually out. Not what I meant, and yet exactly on my point. Anyways, iridescent is a lionfish-based AKA, that's also got a stronger tail and forward fins to help her move on land. What kind of trouble would she get up to? Oh, all sorts. When a little girl can go on land and sea with ease and cannot be easily grabbed and pulled back into order, they learn that there's not much in the way of consequences, even if there actually are. Let me guess, you had to negotiate a few times with people who weren't afraid of the spikes. Who's telling the story? Isma asks and Herbert theatrically enters a thinking pose and holds his chin. Hmm, I think you are. 